up next, we've got our last speaker for the summit here. I see Kurt has turned on his video. I'm going to invite you to go ahead and unmute here as well while I do the short introduction. Now, hey, you know, we, I, I first heard Kurt speak at another event that we were having. And afterwards, we were all like, you know what? It would be nice to hear some more from Kurt. He's got some really good stuff to say. And so, you know, fortunately, he was able to come back today and share some insights and experience around culture, collaboration, and empathy. Now, side note here, you know, a little bit of his background. Kurt is the Chief Cybersecurity Officer at Siemens USA, member of the Siemens Cybersecurity Board. And now check this out. He was appointed to Virgin the Virginia Innovation Partnership Authority as a member of their board of directors. So, hey, without any further ado, Kurt, it's all yours. Thank you, Frank. Um, great introduction, by the way. Um, so let's talk cyber, uh, bringing up the rear is a tough job, but we'll go with it. Um, one of the things you should know about this presentation is, um, it's, it's sort of a mishmash of different topics, which typically cyber leaders don't get a chance to think about. Um, but I've found over the course of the, you know, a few years that are really important, uh, in terms of, of orchestrating an ecosystem in your in your environment, in your company, wherever it may be, and helping you to um, leverage resources, connect with people, and really focus on the reason you're there, which is to um, help protect the business and enable them to take risk. So, there we go, all set. Um, just for, for those of you that don't know, Siemens, um, we are the world's number one industrial software company. We're about 300,000 employees strong in the US specifically. We have roughly 50,000 employees um, and we focus on the type of technologies that help society run, right? So uh, trains, uh, electrification, healthcare, um, automation, uh, smart infrastructure, the list goes on. I'm sorry, I'm trying to click next. There we go. Oh, a little too much. There we go. So um, again, technology, culture, business, and, and, and those three topics uh, and the way you orchestrate those really help you drive successful business outcomes. What is culture? Um, this is very interesting. I think most of us know but, and maybe we do or we don't know just how much of an impact culture has on our ability to be successful. Culture trumps everything. Uh, it, it contributes to our technology choices, the way we go to market, the business objectives, the way we go about uh, removing roadblocks from our organization, uh, the decisions that we make in terms of what security controls to deploy, where we deploy those security controls, um, even uh, how functions, support functions, IT, legal, um, you know, supply chain, how all of them connect, orchestrate, uh, how they collaborate in order to get things done. Um, culture is the underlying driving principle that 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 uh, allows you know an organization to be successful or maybe not. Now, um, my one note on this slide, I would say, is when it comes to culture, is to be intentional. And I use the term culture. There's the broader culture that an organization has, and, and you want to you know, participate, be involved in that as much as possible. But for many of us on the call who may be leaders in, within the organization, I can guarantee you that every single team um, uh, has a subculture. Right, and as leaders, it is our job not just to, con to contribute to the broader culture, provided it's a culture that we um, we like, we feel comfortable in, that helps people to, to succeed, uh, but also in in terms of the subculture uh, that you can can foster in your team, you also want to be intentional about that. And it's not just your team. Many organizations now are doing team of teams, right? A lot of organizations, Siemens included, are moving to this open architecture uh, type approach. In, in essence, it's, it's prioritizing collaboration, openness, transparency, communication, because we were quickly realizing that the speed of business, not just the speed to market, that, that the, biz, the pressure the business feels in terms of going to market, uh, risks, opportunities, 
and I'll talk a little bit about both of those a little later on, um, all of that requires all of us uh, cross-functional uh, teams to, to, to be open and, and communicate as best as we can. And um, I use this as an example. I've heard, I remember I was part of a, um, an executive call. This was like maybe right in the middle of the pandemic. So it had to be um, last year, maybe August or so. And I remember maybe a little later, and I remember the conversation being, are people gonna be working from home? What decisions do we make? Do they work from home or the office? And um, it dawned on me at that point, um, you can call it inspiration based on a lot of the different conversations that, that the executives were having, is that the, if, if you're asking home or office, the answer is yes. And actually the answer is anywhere. And the reason is because when I think back to when I first got into the workforce, I was uh, fresh out of college and really excited to learn as much as I can and, and put, you know, you know, start my journey, be impactful, learn a lot. I was practically in the office every day. I wanted to be in the office every day. Um, I wanted to, to meet people, learn from them and so on. And then as time went on, I got more comfortable uh, in my role. Uh, I, I learned a, a lot. And so I felt, you know, you know what, I can, I can do this from home. I don't feel the burning need to go into the office. Um, and then time went on again, and I got married and had two kids. And then I wanted to be home, right? That was a new experience. Um, and I wanted to spend as much time uh, as possible with the family, um, with, my, with my two girls. And then I got married and got two kids and I wanted to be out of the house. Yeah, so I wanted to be back in the office um, and, and have adult conversations. Uh, and so that was my journey and that journey continues today. But everyone has a, a slightly different journey. I, I think most people out of college maybe wanna go into the office and meet new people, but then what happens if a relative gets sick and they're two states over? Um, do you need to find a new job just to go help take care of that relative? <clears throat> I would argue you should not. And so um, my advocacy, not just here, but in, in conversations that I have with other executives is to view your employees as little bundles of energy who are, are potential, right? Who have varying life uh, conditions and experiences and who oftentimes need the, the flexibility to be able to work from, from uh, I don't know, maybe it's Hawaii for two weeks because they, they really wanna go on vacation with their family and don't want their family to go without them, but they also know they need to meet that deadline. And so they'll kind of go half and half um, or a, a sick parent or something, uh, a relative. And, and that type of mindset also requires it to be built into the culture, which then requires it to be built into the technologies so that you have a flexible working environment um, that allows this work from anywhere model. And then obviously it gets built into the security approach um, so that you uh, are enabling people flexibility to work from practically anywhere. And Another, another topic here has to do with the relationship between cybersecurity team and the user population. Uh, I firmly believe, and I'm, it's up for debate, right? I, I would love for someone to agree or disagree. And, and as I say that, I'll try to um, keep an eye on the chat uh, just in case someone has um, comments or a question. But I firmly believe that practically almost every single control, security control that a security team deploys um, increases friction, right? Everything from, from passwords to multi-factor authentication to uh, there's some that are somewhat transparent and the friction, let's say, is in terms of maybe latency in communication messages, right? So if you have something that's processing emails in the background and eliminating spam and so on, it's virtually undetectable, that, that friction, but there's, there's friction. So every control um, contributes or increases friction. And with the user population, particularly if they're, they're not familiar with security and they don't know the importance of security, um, a little bit of empathy goes a very long way. And so um, at Siemens, for example, we've created this, this really good feedback loop um, where 
we try to um, educate the user population, definitely not in a condescending way because that would backfire, um, but educate the user population, give them more, a little bit more power and authority and, and, and involvement in their security journey. Um, while also being very open and receptive to, to feedback that's coming from that user population. And I firmly believe there is no security team that's large enough um, to solve the cybersecurity issues that any organization faces. And there's no budget that's large enough uh, to, to solve it. Even if you have you know, a trillion dollars and you go spend all trillion of it, you'll probably create an environment so complex that you, you're sort of you know, back at square one. And so, so because of that, then the user population and how they interact with, with security or how they view or think about security is incredibly important. And listening to them, doing um, feedbacks, net promoter scores, um, you know, having a conversation with them, figuring out what their 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 the the highest friction points are, and whether or not the security team is willing to budge, uh, uh, sort of um, doing an assessment of that friction point or security control with um, the return on investment and the the ability for the user population to get their work done. Um, too many times, I think we're, we 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 can be a toll booth where we need to be sort of of um, uh, an an enabler of the business, and, and we can do that through open communication, uh, feedback, and just um, great transparency between the two teams. Uh, and I'll give I'll give one example. One of the programs that we're running at Siemens, which is very very new, but it it it's it's been incredibly insightful, and I'm I'm very passionate about it. Is um, there's some users who are kind of like, just be quiet and let me do my work, keep the friction as low as possible. Uh, you don't bother me, I don't bother you. We all have those users. And uh, nothing wrong with that. They're, they're not hired to do security, they're hired to work on their job. There is a baseline that everyone should, should aspire to, but I get it, they're different people, different folks. But there are other people who are very intrigued by security and very passionate about it. And in, that, in, in a couple of those instances, we've had people reach out to the security team and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm kind of interested. What, what can you teach me? What can I learn? And we've, we've taken at least one, and we're expanding that now on a journey where um, we put them through a case study. Um, we invite them to our team meetings. We um, uh, give them the materials and the information and the knowledge that they need to do a risk assessment of their own organization. And then at the end of it, the plan is to um, have HR give them a challenge coin, right? They can display it on their profile. And just like that, you, uh, and very little to me, very little um, uh, work from the security team to get this done. And just like that, you have created one more bundle of potential that is significantly more uh, well-versed in security than the majority of the user population. And we're calling them cyber champions. Um, and, you know, you do, depending on the size of your organization, right, we have 50,000 people, but even with us, we're starting small to work out the kinks, but you do that over the course of, you know, two or three cohorts over the course of a year, and all of a sudden, you, your security team, in my opinion, is not just the folks on the right, right, and the user population on the left, there's sort of this blended um, approach or, or, or understanding of security which I'm very interested and passionate to see how that goes. Don't spend a lot of time reading this slide. Essentially, all this slide is saying that digitalization, we've been on this journey for a while, it creates new opportunities, but then with those opportunities come risks. Um, and really what I, what, I, what I wanna get out of this or mention before I get into the risk and opportunities from the business perspective is how important it is to have cybersecurity be a fundamental principle. Uh, I see cybersecurity sort of like safety or quality assurance, right? It's some, those are things that are embedded throughout every vertical, every business um, in an effort to make sure that, that we reduce the harm that comes to employees. And cybersecurity is the same harm to the business, harm to our customers, harm to employees in some cases. Um, so, that just demonstrates the um, importance of having it be a foundational principle in the approach. Now, here comes the cool stuff. The, in my opinion, let's see what, what the audience thinks. 
Never before has it been as easy to go from a concept or an idea to a minimum viable product. I mean, it's incredibly just reduced. Before you needed capital, you needed to purchase servers, you need to purchase X, you need to go hire some people with the expertise that you needed to, if we took the waterfall method, you had your requirements and everything, it took forever, very labor and capital intensive. Now with the advent of hyperscalers and being able to swipe your credit card and spin up an entire development pipeline, right, in the cloud. Um, and then, you know, these, these, these websites out there, you can go learn stuff for free or for very cheap coding and so on, or go hire a coder, right, um, uh, from, from somewhere. It's, it's, it's created a very interesting dynamic for companies. And that is, in the past, a well-established company would go with a big player who has developed a particular software. And of course, because it's a big player, that software needed to cover the broadest possible swath of scenarios. So it was a very generalized um, software, regardless of where it's at, whether, we, you know, um, and I'm speaking st strictly security, but you can think of this as not just security, but other aspects of the business as well, from accounting software to whatever the case might be. Um, but now uh, it's the exact opposite. Because of that reduced timeline between concept and minimal viable product, you have this in the security industry, and here I'm focusing on security, you have this very interesting situation where there are these super, or I can say sort of hyper specialized pieces of software. So again, because everyone can sort of um, spin up and go to market relatively quickly, uh, and because of the scalability that hyperscalers bring, you have these people who are going from uh, this scenario where we're going from these really broad, general catch-all software to these really niche, uh, specialized software that can cover a very particular scenario, hence the startup boom. And what that's done for organizations um, is it's created an incredibly noisy tech ecosystem. Um, not only are there incredibly specialized um, software, but then even for that specialized niche area, you have, you know, three, five, 10, 15 players in that area. And so decision making has become incredibly um, more difficult because at what resolution as a security leader, at what resolution do you want to orchestrate your technology ecosystem? Do you go super broad and general? And you have two or three pieces of software, or do you um, uh, do you have these very specialized a connection, or a loose whether it's loose or tight connection of these specialized pieces of software? And it depends, right? There's no right or wrong answer. Although I would argue there is sort of a threshold beyond which, if your if your security stack is more complex than the business itself then there's some fundamental issues there. And then you should probably switch to a cybersecurity business. Um, so there is a threshold, but then the, how you, until you reach that threshold, it depends. And so some fundamental principles here is you wanna make your security um, or your technology ecosystem beyond security. Modular, be intentional about that, right? At what resolution and how do you orchestrate um, what it is that you're trying to do? And then most importantly, um, you wanna fail fast and recover. And the reason that's in there is because um, because of how interconnected our own business ecosystem is and then when you add to that suppliers and how automated the communication with them uh, are, currently is and will continue to increase um, it's a lot of automation microservices and apis are being spun up spun down for the purposes of one or two tasks and so on and so forth so when things when things fail they fail hard and not only that but it, then it can be very difficult to figure out where the failure occurred and and how do we fix it um, I don't think it'll be that way forever, but it's, it's more or less, you know, those are some of the experiences that we have right now. So um, also orchestrate your technology ecosystem to fail fast and recover. Um, keep an eye on time. So um, when it comes to risk and opportunities, businesses are facing the same issue. So um, when it comes to risk, really also very interested, interesting. In the past, a business would uh, contemplate a decision 
they'll say, what's the risk associated with that decision? Okay, sounds good. Um, reach out to supply chain, IT, legal, cyber, and the list goes on and have them give us their input on what they think about this risk or if there are other risks we might be missing. So um, across the business, especially you have like a multi-vertical business uh, and you play in multiple markets or maybe you have different products, um, risks were particularly siloed. They were owned by that vertical and that's it. Uh, it. It tended to flow in one direction. Hey, you give me information. I don't, you don't need to know more than you need to know. Uh, and then more or less that risk was very stationary until it was reduced to the point where it can fall off the list. Where are we today? It, it's very different. Again, because of technology, because of, of the impact it has on the business, it drives every single part of the business from the product development or services all the way, all the way to um, just the support functions. And, and so what I've found is that risks are increasingly um, horizontal. So they're not siloed anymore. So you can't say something um, is just a legal risk, right? It might be a legal risk because of all these other reasons. And this one, is the, the other two are very interesting. I've witnessed risks um, ebb, flow, grow, shrink, and become very fluid. And what I mean by that is something that might start off as a, as a legal risk, then becomes an export control risk, then becomes an IT risk, and it's sort of moving and migrating then it's sort of a cyber specific risk. And then it kind of balloons up and becomes a cyber and an a, a export control risk. And then, and so it ebbs, flows, moves, grows, shrinks. Um, and, and for us in, in cyber, one of the things that we've started to do to, 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 to deal with this is to have a, going back to that term that I used, a very open architecture um, view of how do we conceptualize risk. So in our risk assessment exercise, we'll say, okay, here are the risks that we see within this particular business or this particular part of the infrastructure, whatever the case might be. And then we'll say, okay, how are ways this risk might be realized? And then we'll say, if it, if it is realized, what, which parts of the business or other support functions would be impacted? Uh, and then we would um, go have a conversation with those functions. Do you see it the same way? Or do you see it differently? And, and some simply enough, but it's not something we used to do before. We'll sort of sit back and say, here are all the cyber risks. I'll share that with my CEO um, and, and maybe the CIO, and that's basically it. But now we have these risk councils um, where we can say, okay, let's sit down and figure out what are isolated risks that are specific to that function versus the risks that um, transcend functions or, or, or businesses. And we found that um, uh, it's trending towards the vast majority of the risks um, uh, sort of transcending and, and, and have this, it's almost like a Venn diagram, right? Of, of the risks and, and what they cover. And with that, I would say the opportunities are the same. Let's see if this changes, let me try clicking. Now, the funny thing about this is if you click too many times and it jumps forward like two slides or three slides, I think it jumped forward an extra slide. There we go. Um, and it's the same with opportunities. Um, and there on the right side, I mentioned, right? Flexibility and choice, speed to market, resiliency, evolving business models. One thing that's interesting about opportunities and I'll, I'll categorize opportunities for now strictly in terms of market share is, and this, this factors into IT, which then factors into cyber, or factors into technology, which then factors into cyber, is we're seeing, and, and not just at Siemens, but companies uh, in general, because of that hyper-specialization I mentioned and the speed to market going from concept to MVP as quickly as possible, we're, and we're seeing larger organizations, and I think this will continue to be the case, treat growth in, with two concepts, organic and inorganic. When it comes to organic growth, or maybe we start with the inorganic. When it comes to the inorganic growth, where's, I'm seeing if, if it's a sufficiently commoditized service or product that customers are looking for, if it's a saturated market, if our 
speed to market. By the time we get to market, if we try to build it ourselves, we would miss the majority, the market opportunity and the majority of the market share. And the list goes on. Those are just some of the examples. Then we will do acquisition or we will do partnering, right? So we will go find a technology partner who already has that, um, that, uh, that product and or service and partner with them, bring our expertise, they bring their technology and we go to market. In the organic growth section, I see um, it's, it's driven primarily by IP. So do we have um, a pretty solid hold on intellectual property that would allow us to take as much time as we need? We're not gonna be slow, but we are gonna be longer than we would like to be. As much time as we need to get to market and not have to worry about that because the intellectual property that we have is one such that there's no other place in the market. So that market share or that market in general will still be available if we have to do, if, if we wanna do that organic growth. Um, that's, so that's one reason. Uh, and that organic growth will also help to bolster our own expertise and reinforce our expertise in, this, in that particular market. Um, the other bit for, um, Organic growth typically will be disruptive innovation, but that's hard for larger organizations to do, right? There's two types of innovation. There's sort of the disruptive innovation and incremental innovation. Larger organizations excel at incremental innovation. That's where you kind of improve a product by 3%, 5%. Mm -hmm. um, smaller organizations, because of uh, you know, lack of guardrails and just speed, they tend to excel at disruptive innovation. That's where you take a particular technology and use it in a way that was never done before and never expected before. That's typically what happens with, with um, disruption, right? Because if you think about it, all of the, the, the disruptive technologies that have come, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's not like flying cars, right? It's, it's HTML coding, building a platform, for example, and just using it in a market that people didn't think to use it before. Um, so that's the difference between organic and inorganic growth. And, and so that's important because of cybersecurity and supporting the business, understanding whether they recognize it or not, that's the typical approach of how the business would be focused. Then that allows us to work backwards and be really great advisors for the business and how they approach um, the market conditions, how they approach market challenges, um, how they go about um, avoiding those market challenges and so on. Um, and I think this is the second to last. So here are some here are some 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 fundamental strategic questions you can ask yourself um, and ask your business partners to get the juices flowing to try to drive collaboration, try to um, drive understanding. Right? Uh, you know, I found that typically, if a business, for example, goes out and makes um, a particular partner choice, and it was just a really poor choice because that partner does not take cybersecurity seriously um, and so on and on. let's say a whole host of reasons. Um, typically, most people wanna do the right thing, but typically what happens is that wanting to do the right thing butts, head, butts heads with um, um, business pressures, right? So cost pressure, um, you know, when, when, when that business leader is, is, is getting pressure from, from whether it's the border or wherever the case might be saying, Hey, look, this new product, um, great. You built it within the nine months you were supposed to, but you're on the hook now for 3% compound annual growth rate over the next three years. Um, that's, that's massive. Right. And, and so they're trying to capture whether it's 9% of a particular market, brand new entrant, more or less. That's a significant amount of pressure. And so um, at the same time, the business hasn't performed well over the last three years, right? Or five years. And so they're under significant cost pressures and trying to, and to, to reduce spending and be more efficient, right? They've possibly had to let people go. And so when they go out and make that um, choice for a technology partner, it isn't, and this is where the empathy comes in, it isn't that they intentionally wanna do that. The question as, as cybersecurity leaders we should be asking ourselves is why? What, what 
caused them to do that. Um, if it's lack of knowledge or it wasn't something that they were thinking about, then that's solvable. I mean, all of it is, well, most of it is solvable, not all. If it's, I'm under these cost pressures and I'm just trying to get this thing to market. If there is no market, there is no business and all of us are out of a job. Um, then that's something we should understand, um, not understand and endorse, but understand so that, that the, the nature of the conversations we have, the advice that we give those business leaders um, and our responses to things that we may disagree with uh, are coming from a place that, um, that is really trying to understand the position that person is in and why they might be making the decisions they're making. And but when it, what it comes down to is people. Everything we, everything we do, everything we're able to achieve, the businesses we've built and everything the list goes on, it comes down to people. And the interaction between people in the business context to drive a particular business objective, it matters. It matters, you know? Um, I always say um, how you get there matters. So two people might be equally successful in a business and then one sort of planted flowers and, 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 and there's unicorns running through the garden. Um, and then the other one is in the exact same place, but then you look back as like a trail of like, you know, bad stuff. And so it matters. Um, that should be it. Let me exit out of full screen so that I can um, actually see if there are any questions. Hey, Kurt, excellent information. Yeah. Hey, there was a, a lot of conversation here in your oh, really? Slack channel. Oh, let me open and, that And uh, we got a, a question here. You know, there's a lot of stuff you talked talked about reminded me of some things I've experienced in my career. For example, mm -hmm. I once had a CISO that came mm -hmm. into the organization and he had the express stated goal of changing the culture of the larger organization to make it more like a financial institution. Now, you could probably guess and imagine that hey, it didn't go very well for him. Yeah. And so there was a, a question that generated a lot of discussion here in Slack that was, hey, this culture that we're talking about, is this something that we as the team, we as employees create, or is this something that managers create? And, or how is that, how is that done? And how do, you think, how, do you, how do you think that is actually created for an organization, top down, bottom up? What's been your experience? That's a really good question. And I've thought about it. The most effective way to change culture is through management. And I'm not just talking board of directors or CEO, that's super, that's really critical. Uh, and especially in setting the tone and living, living the tone. Um, but I found uh, that mid-level managers and even supervisors, any, per, any people person or people manager throughout the organization needs to reinforce it. So I think the most effective way is, 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 is top, top line, right? Because that'll filter, but then also from the bottom up, there's always this self-reinforcing um, um, thing that happens when it comes to, to, to the culture. So it's a little bit of both, but if, I am, if, if you wanna really change the culture as quickly as possible, I would contend that, that, that people managers are the ones that, that, that would be the quickest way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. The, uh, maybe the, the last question here is certainly we as leaders can do a lot and we want to we wanna try to create a security aware and a risk aware culture that's sustaining in the organization. But how long do you typically see that taking? How long does it take to create that security aware culture? And what are some things you can do to accelerate that? Mm, excellent question. Um, the, the amount of time it takes depends on how the security team approaches it. If the security team is just sort of a message blaster and sending emails, um, then that's, that, first of all, may not help at all. Uh, and if it does, it might very little. And if it does, then it'll take a very long time. You really want two-way communication. So for example, you know, even with, with at Siemens, I, I send out to, to leadership and I ask my team members to do at every level. Um, and even in regular conversations, let's say we're doing a risk assessment or there's a new asset and we need to protect that asset. Have a conversation. What do you find to be the toughest, the toughest thing about interacting with security? Um, is it as easy as you think? Do you think what do you know what security does? How do you think it, it helps you or benefits you? 
And you mm -hmm. combine and you take that feedback and the security team has to be very open. Now, don't get me wrong. They're going to be non-negotiables. I am sorry. We're not removing multi-factor authentication. But what I'm hearing from you is that just having it be um, a text message only may not work because most of our people travel a lot and they don't get to charge their phones. And so their phones might die. And so they, when they really need it, they can't get access to it. So let's think about, a P, you know, whether it's a PKI card or some other means of, of two-factor authentication. That type of two-way open communication is really critical because this, the, the, the security team needs to depend on the feedback and understand how their work is being uh, perceived and how it's impacting the user population. The user population needs to understand why the security team is working so hard at deploying these, these controls. And you just mentioned the feedback and the, uh, the, the user feedback, the customer feedback. And I said that was going to be the last question, but this next one will truly be the last question because it okay. came in while you were talking is, hey, well, how do you divide that up? A lot of times we in security, we tend to be inwardly focused, improving mm -hmm. our tools, capabilities, and skills. And you were just talking about receiving and acting on that feedback. What's the rough rule of thumb? How much do you um, have the team focus inwardly and how much do you have them focus outwardly? I love, Frank, I'm going to have to bring you to ask me questions at other events. Great question. Uh, or whoever that was, great question. And that's where diversity matters. Typically, tech people, we tend to focus on things, so I absolutely agree. Um, but having a well-diversified team with different backgrounds and skill sets, then there are going to be people um, who love that and focus on it. And I would argue that's a critical part of being a security team, not just a technical aspect. Because we think about it, we're, everything we're doing technically is to help people, right? And to help them get the product to market and so on. Um, I once had a team member who, no matter what idea we came up with, uh, he would say, here are all the reasons why that won't work, right? Not easy to deal with, um, but super valuable because he saved us from several pitfalls. And it's the same with, with empathy and culture and communication. You want a diversified team that can that really have interest and passion for all those different aspects because security is not just technical. Security is, is empathy and, and, and it's technical and it's culture and it's communication and it's business and it's and, 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 and. Security because it's horizontal is um, everything that the business is. And you wanna represent that in your team as much as you can. And nicely said, great way to close the talk and the, uh, the summit overall. So with that, let's go, everybody, let's give uh, Kurt a virtual round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you very much.